In a recent candid revelation, Hollywood heartthrob Brad Pitt has opened up about the love of his life. The actor, known for his high-profile relationships, has confessed that one woman holds a special place in his heart. Join Factsverse as we learn more about this mysterious woman who captured Brad Pitt's heart. Early Relationships Long before becoming the Hollywood heartthrob the world knows today, Brad had a string of early relationships that gave glimpses of his romantic future. In the mid-80s, a young Pitt was romantically linked to British-American singer Sinita. The two dated on and off for nearly two years, with Sinita later warmly describing Pitt as beautiful with an amazing body and saying he was sweet and fun during their time together. He then became involved with actress Jin Skolan after they met on the set of the horror film Cutting Class. Their romance quickly became serious, leading to an engagement in 1989. However, the relationship burned out fast, ending just eight months later when Skolan reportedly developed feelings for a Hungarian director while filming a movie overseas. Pitt was said to be shocked and heartbroken. Pitt proved resilient and was soon linked to Christina Applegate in the late 1980s after he and former roommate Jason Priestley became regulars at gatherings for the sitcom Married with Children. He infamously took Applegate as his date to the 1989 MTV Movie Awards, only for her to ditch him mid-ceremony for another mystery man. Applegate later expressed no hard feelings over the incident and stressed she never dated Pitt beyond that night. By 1990, he was moving on and becoming involved with Juliette Lewis, his co-star in Too Young to Die. Despite their decade-long age gap, with Lewis only 17 at the time, the two quickly became an item. The romance lasted three years and brought Pitt significant media attention. However, their maturity levels ultimately didn't align and led to an amicable 1993 split. While none of these early relationships resulted in lasting love, they provided lessons and paved the way for Pitt's future A-list love life. Gwyneth Paltrow becomes the defining romance of his youth. Pitt's romantic trajectory markedly changed course when he crossed paths with Gwyneth Paltrow on the set of the 1995 thriller Seven. Their on-screen meeting as husband and wife quickly sparked a real-life relationship, too. By 1996, they fully were embraced as Hollywood's new it couple. Paltrow was Pitt's first truly high-profile romance, raising his star power by association. Their whirlwind courtship culminated in an engagement announced in December 1996. According to reports, Pitt got down on one knee during a trip to Argentina and presented Paltrow with a custom $85,000 diamond ring. During an emotional acceptance speech at the 1996 Golden Globes the next month, a besotted Pitt publicly thanked his angel Paltrow and called her the love of his life. But cracks reportedly formed behind their idyllic image. Rumors swirled that the couple's arguments over career demands and diverging lifestyles drove them apart. In June 1997, they shocked fans by suddenly announcing their breakup just months after the engagement. Though neither elaborated much at the time, Paltrow later characterized the split as devastating. Pitt seemed to struggle to get over losing Paltrow for years. In the aftermath, he temporarily gave up life in L.A., suggesting he was burnt out from his intense time with Paltrow in the glaring Hollywood spotlight. However, he and Paltrow eventually moved past the heartbreak to become friends. Pitt even made a surprise cameo in Paltrow's 2010 country music film, Duets. A fairy tale marriage to Jennifer Aniston captivates the world. Pitt entered a new stratosphere of fame through his marriage to TV megastar Jennifer Aniston. After being set up on a 1998 blind date arranged by their agents, Pitt and Aniston quickly became attached and formed Hollywood's new golden couple. With Aniston starring on Friends at the peak of its popularity, their pairing captivated the public and entertainment media. Everything seemed to align for the photogenic duo, who shared sun-kissed good looks and all-American charm. Their lavish $1 million wedding on July 29, 2000 was akin to a royal ceremony in the eyes of adoring fans. Held at a Malibu estate, it included 200 guests, a gospel choir, fireworks, and 50,000 flowers. As husband and wife, Pitt made cameos on Friends, while Aniston accompanied him to premieres and award shows. According to accounts, they hoped to start a family but struggled with fertility issues. On screen, he delivered some of his most acclaimed performances in films like Fight Club, Ocean's Eleven, and Troy during this period with Aniston firmly by his side. But cracks began to appear. 
On January 7, 2005, they devastated devotees by announcing their separation in a joint statement. While they cited no third party as the cause, just months later, Pitt was photographed with his Mr. and Mrs. Smith co-star Angelina Jolie, prompting affair rumors. Aniston filed for divorce that March, with it finalized in October of 2005. A Tumultuous Romance with Angelina Jolie On the heels of his shocking split from Jennifer, Pitt became embroiled in another headline-grabbing romance with Angelina Jolie. Sparks first flew between the pair while filming steamy scenes as married assassins for 2005's Mr. and Mrs. Smith. At the time, Pitt was still married to Aniston, while Jolie recently adopted her son Maddox. Following Pitt's divorce filing, his fledgling relationship with Jolie rapidly intensified under the media microscope. Their courtship coincided with major expansion of their family. Jolie formally adopted daughter Zahara in early 2005, with Pitt later signing on as a parent. The couple then welcomed their first biological child, daughter Shiloh, in May 2006. Over the next decade, Brangelina dominated headlines as they globetrotted, starred in films together, and expanded the family. But after seven years and six kids together, Pitt and Jolie announced their engagement in 2012. They married on August 23, 2014 at their estate, Chateau Miraval in France. However, just two years later, Jolie stunned the world, filing for divorce, citing irreconcilable differences. Pitt declares the defining love of his life. The most unexpected revelation in Pitt's 2021 interview was him naming actress Juliette Lewis as the love of his life. His declaration stunned many who assumed ex-wives Jennifer Aniston or Angelina Jolie held that distinction. But Pitt expressed profound affection for Lewis, his co-star in Too Young to Die, with whom he was involved from 1990 to 93. Though their age gap raised eyebrows, Lewis reportedly matured beyond her years while Pitt retained a youthful spirit. According to Pitt, they shared an almost preternatural connection that allowed them to mutually support each other's creative aspirations. He credits Lewis with furthering his desire to prove himself as a serious actor. He also noted that they were able to experience the magic of his career ascent together while still relatively anonymous. The innocence and discovery of this period before Pitt achieved mega fame made it overwhelmingly special and formative. He maintains Lewis awakened his heart and mind in ways that no other relationship has done before or since. From humble beginnings in calm North Dakota, Angie Dickinson has captivated audiences with her remarkable talents for over six decades. Born Angeline Brown in 1931 to Leo Henry Brown and Frederica Hare, Angie was the second of four daughters from a family with deep German roots. Growing up in a Catholic household, Angie attended Bellarmine Jefferson High School in Burbank, California, where she excelled academically and won the sixth annual Bill of Rights Essay Contest at just 15 years old. Initially aspiring to be a writer, her life took a fortuitous turn when she won a beauty contest in 1953. She went on to study at Immaculate Heart College and Glendale Community College while working as a secretary at Lockheed Air Terminal in a parts factory. In 1954, she landed her first acting job in a Warner Brothers movie and soon became a fixture on anthology TV series throughout the 50s. But it was her breakthrough role in 1956's Gun the Man Down that truly put her on the map, and she solidified her stardom with the Golden Globe Award for New Star of the Year for her performance in 1959's Rio Bravo, alongside John Wayne and Dean Martin. Throughout the 60s, Angie became one of the most popular leading ladies in Hollywood, appearing in a string of hit films, including Ocean's Eleven, The Sins of Rachel Cade, The Killers, and Point Blank. Her success on the big screen continued throughout the 70s, and she went on to appear in films like Pretty Maids All in a Row, The Outside Man, and Big Bad Mama. But Angie's talents weren't limited to the big screen. She also achieved TV fame as Sergeant Pepper Anderson in the NBC crime series Police Woman, winning a Golden Globe Award for Best Actress for a television series, and receiving three Emmy nominations. Her career continued to flourish until 2009 with standout performances in Dress to Kill, Even Cowgirls Get the Blues, Sabrina, Pay It Forward, and Big Bad Love. Off-screen, Angie's love life was just as captivating. She married football player Jean Dickinson in 1952, but they divorced in 1960. Angie embarked on a passionate affair with Frank Sinatra, whom she met on the set of Ocean's Eleven. 
She married composer Burt Bacharach in 1965, but their marriage was troubled by their daughter's premature birth and Asperger's syndrome, as well as Bacharach's infidelity, leading to their divorce in 1981. Angie never remarried, but had relationships with a string of famous men, including Johnny Carson, Mickey Mantle, Richard Burton, Dean Martin, Charles Feldman, Larry King, and David Jansen. Now 91 years old, Angie lives in LA and remains an influential figure in the entertainment industry. She's been honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and an induction into the Television Hall of Fame. Dickinson's Candid Fox Interview Angie recently opened up about her love life and relationship with Frank Sinatra in an interview she gave to Fox News. The 91-year-old actress is currently gearing up to present her 1959 film Rio Bravo at the TCM Classic Film Festival this spring. She discussed her experience filming the following major film to include her name, 1960's Ocean's Eleven. According to Dickinson, Frank Sinatra was the love of her life and the mere thought of him still brings a smile to her face. She spoke highly of his talents as a singer and an actor, and while acknowledging he possessed both good and bad qualities, praised his personality. The two had a close bond and even contemplated marriage in 1964, although Dickinson ultimately decided against it, stating that they were content in their relationship without the need for marriage. Furthermore, she expressed admiration for Sinatra's ex-wife Nancy, who treated her with friendship and respect. After discussing her divorce from Burt Bacharach in 1981, Dickinson reflected on her memories of working with Dean Martin in Rio Bravo and how they became close friends. She described him as a funny and kind man who never failed to make her laugh despite his on-screen portrayal of a drunk. Additionally, she reminisced about John Wayne, another co-star from Rio Bravo, who initially intimidated her on set, but was ultimately supportive and provided her with invaluable advice on acting and handling fame. As far as her career, Dickinson expressed immense gratitude for the opportunities she had and continues to hold a deep passion for acting. Sinatra's Secret so what exactly was it about Sinatra that made him irresistible in the eyes of Angie and the countless other ladies who swooned over him? Let's just say Frank had a not-so-little secret that gave him quite the advantage in the dating world. His captivating persona went beyond his famous blue eyes, especially when it came to seducing women. He was not only a music icon and Hollywood star, but a notorious womanizer. His second wife, Ava Gardner, even went on record to describe his anatomy in explicit terms. According to her, he was exceptionally well endowed. She once even quipped that out of his 110-pound frame, 10 pounds of it was dedicated to his manhood. Despite being married with children, Sinatra indulged in his insatiable appetite for women from his early big band days, making his way through Hollywood starlets like Marilyn Monroe, Lana Turner, and Marlene Dietrich as well as engagements to Lauren Bacall and Juliet Prowse, and a short marriage to Mia Farrow. Sinatra's extraordinary voice and charisma undoubtedly contributed to his success with women. But according to his friend Gianni Russo, his ample endowment left no woman wanting. Sinatra's valet even revealed in his book that the star had special underwear made to contain and conceal his size in public. Even Sinatra acknowledged his animalistic desires, stating he was just looking to make it with as many women as he could. Three's the Charm The recently published book Sinatra and Me in the Wee Small Hours by Frank's former road manager, Tony Apodisano, is a memoir of the author's friendship and professional relationship with Sinatra. When speaking about Angie Dickinson, Sinatra was quoted in the book as saying she was one of the best lovers he ever had the pleasure of knowing. It's clear that Sinatra's love was fueled by his lust for her, but anyone familiar with Frank knows his carnal passion was never focused on just one person. He reportedly had an insatiable thirst for women, sometimes betting multiple partners a day and frequently several at the same time. According to Apodisano, Sinatra often sought out threesomes and more often than not, these flings would lead him to strike up turbulent relationships that would cause him much hardship and headaches in the long run. Aside from his sexual conquests and relationship, the book also discusses things like Sinatra's alleged involvement in the CIA plot to assassinate Fidel Castro, his belief that Marilyn Monroe was murdered, and Sinatra's friendship and business dealings with high-ranking mob bosses. 
Suze Rotolo. Before we reveal who the singer-songwriter said was the love of his life, let's take a few minutes to briefly recap Dylan's romantic history. First, we'll talk about a woman who served as the inspiration behind many of his greatest songs. Suze Rotolo, Bob Dylan's early 60s girlfriend, who famously walked alongside him on the cover of The Freewheelin' Bob Dylan, passed away on February 25, 2011, after a long illness. Rotolo was only 17 when she and Dylan started dating in 1961, shortly after his arrival in New York City. She served as Dylan's muse for many of his early love songs, including Tomorrow is a Long Time, Don't Think Twice It's Alright, and Boots of Spanish Leather. In Dylan's memoir, Chronicles Volume 1, published in 2004, he wrote about meeting Rotolo backstage at a concert and being immediately smitten. They lived together in early 1962 in a small apartment on West 4th Street. Rotolo's left-wing politics and her work with CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, played a significant role in Dylan's political awakening. She also inspired Dylan's early protest song, The Death of Emmett Till, after telling him about the shocking 1955 murder of Till. She also provided critical feedback on many of Dylan's early songs, checking them for accuracy and political sensibility. But Dylan's rising fame and the pressure that came with it strained their relationship, and they split for good in late 1963. After the breakup, Rotolo remained in New York City and pursued a career as a teacher, painter, and book illustrator. She also authored a memoir in 2009 entitled A Freewheel in Time, a memoir of Greenwich Village in the 60s. Joan Baez Bob Dylan and Joan Baez were musical partners and friends for decades, but for a few years, also lovers. They were both iconic and influential musicians, helping each other grow as artists and inspiring each other to create timeless music. Without Joan, Dylan may never have gone electric and become the legend he is today. And without Dylan, Joan may never have discovered her own voice and become the timeless icon she is today. The two started dating reportedly in 1961, but their relationship ended in 1965. Dylan was the one to end things. While the exact reason is unknown, it's speculated it had something to do with Dylan's transition to electric music and Baez feeling left behind. But they remained close friends and continued to collaborate on stage and in the studio. Dylan later apologized for his regrettable behavior during their relationship, but the apology was not made public until the PBS documentary Joan Baez, How Sweet the Sound, in 2009. In the film, Dylan said he was sorry for ending the relationship and explained he did it in part to keep her from being caught up in the madness of his all-over-the-place career. They largely avoided each other when they performed at the 2010 White House Civil Rights Concert, but Joan continued to paint portraits of celebrities, including Dylan, and even sang about their breakup in her ballad, Diamonds. Dylan, on the other hand, expressed his admiration for Baez's unique guitar style and heartbreaking soprano voice in his own documentary about her. Sarah Lowndes Throughout his dating history, Bob Dylan has been notorious for often being thoughtless and having a tendency to withdraw suddenly from people close to him. His first wife, Sarah Lowndes, was no exception. The two met in 1964 while she was still married to magazine photographer Hans Lowndes. Likewise, Dylan was still romantically involved with Joan Baez. According to Victor Maymoudis, Dylan's old tour manager, Dylan shocked him when he revealed he was marrying Sarah instead of Joan. When asked why he was choosing Lowndes over Baez, Dylan explained Sarah would be there when he needed her to be, unlike Joan, who wouldn't always be available. Dylan and Lowndes tied the knot in 1965, shortly after she divorced Hans and Dylan left Baez. Sarah had a profound impact on Dylan. She transformed him into a family man who was dedicated to his wife and children. Dylan spoke highly of her in his memoir and immortalized her in many of his songs. During the period when Dylan became more introspective as a person and a songwriter, he wrote songs about his desire for a home life, but also his urge to keep moving. While at first their relationship seemed to be a match made in heaven, their marriage faced challenges when Dylan started drinking, cheating, and instigating fights over home improvements. They eventually separated, but there was still hope, at least in Dylan's mind, of rekindling the relationship. In 1975, while putting the finishing touches on his album Desire, Dylan played a song he had written for Lowndes, fittingly called Sarah, when she came to visit him at Columbia Studios. He sang it directly to her, trying his best to serenade her with the song that proudly declared her to be the love of his life, while she sat with an expressionless face. 
It was obvious Dylan was doing everything he could to reach her, but she seemed to be utterly unmoved, leading everyone else who was in the studio at the time to feel quite uncomfortable. While some claim she later welcomed him back, their relationship ultimately ended for good. Years later, Dylan remarked he wasn't a good husband, but he believes to this day the relationship wasn't a total failure as it led to him becoming a better father. His song Sarah shows the depth of his devotion to her, and some believe his song To Make You Feel My Love, released 20 years after their separation, may have also been about the love he still harbored for her. Dylan's Other Loves In addition to these relationships, he's had affairs with several other notable women. He had a brief encounter with French singer-songwriter Francois Hardy in the mid-60s and wrote I Want You for her. Dylan was rumored to have been involved with socialite and actress Edie Sedgwick in 1965, who was also a muse for Andy Warhol and inspired songs such as Just Like a Woman and Leopard Skin Pillbox Hat. In the 70s, he had a relationship with actress Sally Kirkland, who appeared in his film Ronaldo and Clara and sang backup vocals on his album Desire. He had a relationship with actress and singer Ronnie Blakely, who co-starred with him in the film and sang a duet with him on the song Hurricane. In the late 70s, he proposed to soul singer Mavis Staples, but she turned him down. Dylan was additionally involved with former Beatles assistant and music industry insider Chris O'Dell in the late 70s, which she later wrote about in her memoir. He had a long-term relationship with former model and actress Ruth Tyrangiel from 74 to 94, which ended in a palimony suit settled out of court. In 1986, he married his backup singer, Carolyn Dennis, and they had a daughter together, but divorced in 1992, keeping the marriage secret until 2001. He also dated his backup singer, Helena Springs, in the late 1980s and early 90s, and they co-wrote songs such as Tight Connection to My Heart and Seeing the Real You at Last. As of now, Bob is believed to be single, but he continues to release music and recently sold his entire catalog of songs to Universal Music Group in 2020 for an estimated $300 million. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2016 for his contributions to American songwriting. Johnny's First Marriage Johnny Carson's first marriage was to Jody Walcott, and their union began long before Carson rose to fame. Johnny and Jody first met in college at the University of Nebraska, where they both attended. The couple tied the knot October 1, 1949, when Carson was just 24. At that time, he was working as a radio announcer in Omaha. Carson's career began to take off, and he moved to California, where he found success as a TV personality. But the pressures and demands of his burgeoning career took a toll on his marriage. Jody, who preferred a quieter and more private life, found it challenging to adapt to Carson's increasing fame and the public scrutiny that accompanied it. The strain on their relationship eventually led to their separation, and they officially divorced in 1963 after 14 years of marriage. Despite the end of their romantic relationship, they remained on amicable terms and continued to support each other throughout their lives. After their divorce, Jody maintained a low-profile life away from the public eye. She remarried and largely stayed out of the spotlight. Carson, on the other hand, went on to become a TV icon as host of The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson, where he entertained audiences for three decades until his retirement in 1992. Ultimately, his first marriage set the stage for the subsequent chapters of his life, including his subsequent marriages, and unparalleled success as one of the most beloved and influential figures in late-night television. But despite the failure of the marriage, it did produce three children. His first son, Richard Carson, was born October 14, 1950. Richard led a relatively private life and chose to stay away from the spotlight. He pursued a career in music and became an accomplished jazz musician. Carson's second son, Christopher, was born in 1952. Like his older brother, he also preferred to maintain a low profile. He pursued a career in television production and worked behind the scenes rather than in front of the camera. Carson's youngest son, Corey, was born June 20, 1953. Tragically, his life was cut short when he passed away on June 21, 1991, at age 38, due to a car accident. Corey's untimely death was a tragic loss for the family, and it deeply affected Johnny. Throughout his career, Johnny was fiercely protective of his children's privacy, ensuring they were shielded from the media and public attention. Johnny's Second Marriage Carson found love once again and walked down the aisle with Joanne Copeland, August 17, 1963. 
Joanne, a former model and interior decorator, brought a new chapter of companionship and support into Johnny's life. Their relationship seemed promising, and they appeared to be a well-matched couple. Copeland's beauty and grace complemented Carson's wit and charm, making them an attractive pair both on and off screen. During their marriage, Carson's career continued to soar. Copeland embraced her role as the supportive spouse, standing by her husband's side as he became an iconic figure. However, despite the initial promise of their union, the pressures and demands of the Carson's high-profile career once again proved challenging for the couple. The long hours, constant public scrutiny, and seductive allure of showbiz took its toll on their relationship. In 1972, after nearly nine years of marriage, Johnny Carson and Joanne Copeland parted ways. The decision surrounding their separation and subsequent divorce has remained relatively private, with both parties maintaining a level of discretion. Copeland retreated from the public eye, choosing to focus on her personal life. Johnny's Third Marriage Johnny embarked on his third marriage with Joanna Holland, a former model and socialite. After the dissolution of his second marriage to Joanne Copeland, Carson found love once again and tied the knot with Holland September 30, 1972. She brought a fresh energy and sophistication into Carson's life. Known for her beauty and vivacity, Holland added a touch of glamour to the relationship. The couple's marriage lasted for a decade, during which time they navigated the ups and downs of Carson's high-profile career and the accompanying pressures. Despite their initial connection and the public image of a picture-perfect couple, their relationship eventually encountered difficulties, and they separated. In 1983, after 11 years of marriage, Johnny and Joanna officially divorced. The specifics have remained private, with both parties maintaining discretion. Following the divorce, Holland sought to maintain a relatively low-profile life. And of course, Carson continued on as host of The Tonight Show. Johnny's Fourth Marriage Johnny Carson's fourth marriage proved to be his most enduring and meaningful. He found true love and companionship with Alexis Moss, a former stockbroker. Their relationship blossomed and they exchanged vows on June 20, 1987. Alexis became an integral part of Carson's life, providing unwavering support and love throughout their marriage. Their bond was evident to those who knew them, as they were often seen attending events together, sharing laughter and supporting each other in both good times and challenging moments. Moss proved to be a constant presence in Carson's life, particularly in his later years when his health declined. As Carson faced various health issues, including emphysema and ultimately his battle with lung cancer, Moss was there by his side. Her devotion and unwavering commitment to Carson's well-being were apparent as she took on the role of his primary caregiver, ensuring he received the best possible care. Carson's declining health necessitated a more private life, and Moss respected his desire for a low-key existence. She shielded him from the public eye and allowed him to enjoy his retirement years in relative seclusion. As Carson's health continued to deteriorate, Moss became his rock and constant source of support. She remained devoted to him until the end, ensuring he was comfortable and surrounded by love. Carson once famously described her as the love of his life, a testament to the profound connection they shared. After Johnny's passing, January 23, 2005, Alexis continued to honor his legacy and the bond they had built. While she preferred a private life, her unwavering dedication to Carson remained evident, and she played an integral role in preserving his memory. She provided love, care, and companionship to him during the final years of his life, solidifying her place as a pillar of support and the person he cherished most. Interestingly enough, Alexis came from an incredibly wealthy family and was a socialite and heiress long before she and Carson met. So there were never any claims that their love was based on his success or his money. And while she certainly did inherit much of his wealth, some sources claiming she was worth around $300 million in 2018, she actually ended up giving a ton of it away to charity. Reportedly, she gave nearly $156 million to the Johnny Carson Foundation. This generosity was no doubt linked to her upbringing and the positive influence Carson had on her. She was able to continue his legacy and keep showing her devotion and love to him by making such huge donations in both of their names. Cher Cher and Tom Cruise's whirlwind romance began in 1985, after being introduced at the lavish celebrity wedding of Sean Penn and Madonna in Malibu. Their magnetic attraction was instantly apparent to all in attendance. In the subsequent weeks, Cher and Tom grew inseparable 
as their passionate relationship rapidly intensified. They spent countless nights wrapped in each other's arms, discovering deeper levels of connection both physically and emotionally. But as Tom's Hollywood star continued ascending at breakneck speed, so too did his involvement in Scientology. The growing religiosity started causing tensions with the freewheeling share. Despite their undeniable spark, irreconcilable differences over the church drove them to an abrupt yet amicable split after only a few short months. Even decades later, though, Cher still remembers Tom fondly as, quote, one of the top five lovers I've ever had. He was a great guy, the person I knew then. Mimi Rogers Mimi Rogers met a young and ambitious Tom Cruise in 1987. As a longtime Scientologist herself, she wanted to share the profound impact the church had had on her life with her new love. She introduced Tom to Scientology classes where he found solace and community. Their spiritual bond grew strong, and after a whirlwind romance, Tom and Mimi tied the knot that same year. But the pressures of Tom's skyrocketing fame took their toll on the marriage. As he immersed deeper into Scientology's higher mysteries, an increasing divide emerged as Mimi struggled to keep pace. After three years, they acknowledged their divergent paths and finalized a divorce in 1990. Nicole Kidman Cruz's marriage to Nicole Kidman was intense and fiery, if short-lived. The Australian actress first met Cruz on the set of Days of Thunder, and they fell into a whirlwind romance. Enraptured with one another, they married in a small Christmas Eve ceremony just months after meeting. Kidman gushed she was consumed by love for Cruz, willing to toss her life plans aside for their relationship. Eager to start a family, they adopted two children during their 11-year union. Together, they enjoyed an idyllic, beautiful existence centered around their love. Kidman fondly remembers time spent just the two of them, feeling like they were the only people in the world. She also enjoyed starring alongside Cruz in films like Far and Away, where their natural chemistry translated on screen. Their collaboration in Stanley Kubrick's erotic thriller Eyes Wide Shut only strengthened their intimacy through the steamy filming process. However, cracks in the relationship emerged. Constant tabloid gossip about Scientology's role strained the marriage, as Kidman refused to join the controversial church. In 2001, to Kidman's devastation, Cruz abruptly initiated divorce proceedings. She admits it took years to recover from the heartbreak. In hindsight, Kidman sees youthful impulsiveness in their rapid courtship and regrets not recognizing red flags. Penelope Cruz In 2001, Tom Cruise met Penelope Cruz on the set of their film Vanilla Sky. Their natural charisma and passion for their craft sparked an instant chemistry. Though Tom had just finalized his divorce from Nicole, Penelope's beauty and zest captivated him. They kept their budding romance under wraps, until Tom's divorce was settled, not wanting to make headlines for the wrong reasons. Once publicly dating in 2002, Penelope supported Tom loyally at events for Scientology. While she admired his dedication, the church's rigid doctrines did not fully resonate with her free spirit. Over several years, their differences on Scientology widened a growing divide. By 2004, it was clear the relationship had run its natural course. Katie Holmes Tom Cruise was swept off his feet by Katie Holmes' charm and beauty after meeting in 2005. Their connection sparked instantly with Cruise famously proclaiming his newfound love by jumping on Oprah's couch. Just weeks after meeting, they were engaged with a fairy tale wedding in an Italian castle to follow. Holmes was enraptured by Cruise, calling him her dream man, who made her laugh and feel loved like never before. She gave birth to daughter Suri in 2006, and enthusiasm for their life as a family radiated from the couple. To the public, they seemed blissfully happy, with Holmes claiming they would be forever in their honeymoon phase. But after five years of marriage, Holmes abruptly filed for divorce in 2012, reportedly stunning Cruz. Concerns over Scientology's influence, especially on their daughter, were rumored to be factors. Though initially smitten, the fantasy dissolved into a contentious split. Holmes has since said, That intense time defined her greatly, for better or worse, and she's still recovering from the emotional upheaval of it all. Nazanin Boniati Not long after his split from Penelope Cruz in 2005, Tom found companionship with talented British-Iranian actress Nazanin Boniati. 
They bonded over their shared passion for acting and appreciation of global cultures. Nazanin was swept up in Tom's charming allure and dedication to his career. For several months, they enjoyed whirlwind dates around Hollywood and abroad. But she began to feel unease from certain Church of Scientology members monitoring her constantly as Tom's girlfriend. The strict rules and isolation took a psychological toll. By early 2005, she quietly ended things to protect her well-being. Haley Atwell When Tom Cruise met English actress Haley Atwell on the set of Mission Impossible 7 in 2020, they bonded over their mutual love of performing thrilling action scenes. Haley was impressed by Tom's unparalleled work ethic and commitment to realistic stunt work. After filming Wrapped the following year, their working relationship turned romantic. Eager to spend more time together, Tom wined and dined Haley at Hollywood's hottest restaurants. But the frantic pace of keeping their romance under wraps while promoting two big-budget films proved unsustainable. By mid-2022, it became clear the long distances as Tom resumed shooting had taken a toll. Shakira In 2023, Tom found himself drawn to the magnetic energy of global pop icon Shakira at a Formula One race in Miami. The Colombian superstar was charming crowds and Tom sought her out to compliment her stage presence. He invited Shakira to join his private box for the remainder of the event. Dazzled by her beauty and talent, Tom asked for Shakira's number. Despite an intriguing first meeting, their schedules proved incompatible. Sofia Vergara as the one who got away while promoting his latest film, Tom Cruise wistfully spoke of Colombian actress Sofia Vergara as, quote, the one who got away. He recalled meeting Sofia nearly two decades prior at an industry event. He was instantly captivated by Sofia's radiant beauty and vivacious personality. They shared a profound connection that night, leading to fleeting but passionate dates in Los Angeles. However, as Sofia's career in Hollywood began taking off, Tom was busy ascending to global superstardom. The demands of their profession sadly prevented their burgeoning romance from blossoming further. Despite losing touch over the years, Sophia remained in Tom's memories as the rare woman who effortlessly stirred both his heart and soul. He regretted not pursuing her more ardently when fate had brought them together. When asked about Tom, Sophia simply smiled, saying he was quite the charmer. Early Relationships Cher's early relationships laid the groundwork for her love life. Her first marriage was to her musical partner and mentor, Sonny Bono, whom she wed in 1964 shortly after they met. Though their fast friendship quickly sparked into romance, their differences caused issues over time. Cher reportedly felt Bono tried to limit her personal growth and independence. After a decade together, Cher filed for divorce in 1974, citing involuntary servitude. Their split was contentious, with disagreements over finances and custody of their son Chaz, born in 1969. Yet they were able to repair their relationship in later years, evident when Cher delivered an emotional eulogy when Sonny died in a 1998 skiing accident. Just days after finalizing her split from Sonny, Cher tied the knot with Southern rock icon Greg Allman, apparently throwing caution to the wind in her desire to wed the singer-songwriter. Their passion couldn't overcome Allman's issues with substance abuse, however. Nine days into the union, Cher filed for divorce, though the couple later reconciled when Allman entered rehab. They welcomed his son Elijah in 1976 and recorded an album together in 77. Ultimately, Allman's addiction proved too disruptive and Cher filed for divorce again in 1979. Though their romantic relationship didn't endure, she cared for Allman deeply. After his death in 2017, she tweeted that he was a kind, loving man and that their parting was immeasurable. In the wake of the two failed music marriages, Cher had fleeting romances with high-profile men like Warren Beatty, record exec David Geffen, and Kiss frontman Gene Simmons. None seemed to measure up to the connections she forged with Sonny Bono and Greg Allman until she crossed paths with Val Kilmer. Their instant rapport marked the start of Cher's most passionate affair yet. Finding Love with Val In the early 80s, Cher attended a birthday party where she was introduced to a young actor named Val Kilmer. Though they didn't click romantically at first, Cher reported that they bonded over their similar humor and outlook. Kilmer soon became a constant platonic presence in her life and home. 
Over time, their emotional intimacy sparked a fiery passion between the actress, singer, and the up-and-coming film star. By Cher's account, the age gap between her and Kilmer, more than a decade, did not dampen their connection. She confessed Kilmer made her feel excited in ways other men did not, sweeping her up in impulsive adventures and fearless creativity. Having emerged from two failed music marriages, Cher was wary of committing to another relationship. But the thrilling Kilmer apparently broke through her defenses with his talent, intelligence, and tender heart. During their romance, he grew close to Cher's children and encouraged her acting aspirations at a pivotal time. She credited him with bolstering her confidence before her Oscar-winning role in the 1985 film Mask. Behind closed doors, their passion was fiery and dramatic at times, as both were used to being the alpha in relationships. Kilmer was eccentric and unpredictable, while Cher had earned a reputation as strong-willed and outspoken. Ultimately, their heated arguments couldn't withstand the strength of the love between them. For several glorious years, they enjoyed what Cher described as unbelievable times marked by laughter, adventure, and mutual admiration. Still, Kilmer's mercurial nature and Cher's fame eventually graded on their union. As two highly creative spirits, neither was willing to compromise their individuality for the relationship, nor should they have been expected to. Sadly, by the mid-80s, Cher and Kilmer had parted ways romantically. Their electrifying love affair had burned fast and bright, then flickered out all too soon. Yet unlike Cher's past paramours, Kilmer found an enduring place in her heart as one of her deepest emotional connections. Though the physical aspect of their love cooled off, the pair remained incredibly close in the decades beyond the breakup. Their innate friendship, independent of the sexual relationship, laid the foundation for the next phase in their iconic bond. Lasting Bond of Friendship Following the dissolution of their passionate affair, Cher and Val Kilmer managed to cultivate an exceptionally close friendship that endured over four decades. Having forged a genuine connection, not hinged solely on their sexual chemistry, they transitioned smoothly into being trusted confidants. This platonic bond weathered Cher's future relationships, Kilmer's battle with cancer, and the test of time. Cher fondly reported that she and Kilmer referred to one another with silly nicknames like Sid and Ethel, underscoring the levity and comfort between them even post-breakup. During holidays, they spent time together with Cher's children without any lingering awkwardness from their former relationship. The pair continued attending one another's film premieres and Broadway performances in an ongoing display of support. And over the years, they routinely checked in and kept tabs on each other's lives. When Kilmer fell seriously ill with throat cancer, threatening both his health and his acting voice, he relied heavily on the steadfast Cher as a pillar of strength. Having witnessed the severity of his condition firsthand while caregiving Kilmer, Cher called him brave in his fight and recovery from the life-threatening disease. Despite his reliance on assisted speech, Kilmer selflessly helped Cher through her own personal losses, such as the deaths of Sonny Bono and Greg Allman, with his trademark brand of humor and empathy. In 2021, Kilmer made the difficult choice to allow cameras to document his physical transformation and emotional journey for the film Val. After initially avoiding watching the intensely vulnerable documentary at first, Cher worked up the courage and was awestruck by her dear friend's courage and artistic integrity. She said Kilmer's willingness to showcase his raw, authentic self, even at his worst moments, encapsulated his essence as a groundbreaking artist and a beautiful soul. Other Significant Relationships Cher's relationship with Tom Cruise, which began in the mid-80s, was a significant chapter in her romantic story. The relationship was marked by a deep connection despite the significant age difference and Cruise's rising status as a star. Cher has spoken out about the genuine care and affection they shared, emphasizing the respect and understanding that formed the foundation of their bond. Rob Camilletti Cher's romance with Rob Camilletti, a bagel baker and aspiring actor, began in 1986 and grabbed the media's attention. Despite public scrutiny and criticism over their age difference, Cher found solace and stability with Camilletti. The relationship was marked by a sense of normalcy and privacy that Cher often longed for in her turbulent life. Richie Sambora Cher's liaison with Richie Sambora, best known as the guitarist for Bon Jovi, was another notable relationship. While their time together was brief, she's acknowledged the passion and excitement that defined the romance. 
In reflecting on the man who had passed through her glamorous life, Cher affirmatively named Val Kilmer as the one who fulfilled her on all levels – spiritual, intellectual, emotional, and physical. A Long-Lasting Love Story Pat Boone, the well-known pop singer of the 50s and 60s, shared a special bond with his wife, Shirley Boone, for over six decades. Despite Shirley's passing, Pat tries to carry on, pursuing his interests like golf and spending time with his daughters. The couple's love story began when they were teens, and their romance blossomed quickly. Pat was determined to marry Shirley, so he asked her father, Ted Foley, for his approval. Foley, a famous country singer, was moved by Pat's request, gave him his blessing, and asked him to take care of his daughter. The couple subsequently eloped in 1953 and settled in Teaneck, New Jersey, where they raised their four children. Throughout their marriage, Pat and Shirley supported each other's careers. Pat graduated cum laude from Columbia University while pursuing his music career, and Shirley was a philanthropist and author. Not only that, but Pat and Shirley also did their best to lift each other up spiritually and emotionally. While pursuing his singing career, Pat reached immense popularity and rivaled Elvis Presley on the charts. Meanwhile, Shirley focused on raising their children as they moved to Beverly Hills, where they lived for 50 years and watched their family grow with 16 grandchildren and 10 great-grandchildren. In an effort to keep the marriage exciting, the couple went on multiple honeymoons, even after being together for over six decades. Pat recently reflected on their relationship and shared that Shirley found the most joy in being a devoted mother, wife, and grandmother and bringing harmony to their home. Despite being a homemaker for the majority of her life, Shirley was also a successful recording artist, best-selling author, TV host, and humanitarian. While their marriage wasn't without flaws, Pat credited their commitment to each other and their faith as the foundation of their long-lasting relationship. In times of hardship, they held on to their promises to each other and to God. Grandpa to 16 Sadly, Pat Boone's wife, Shirley, passed away at age 84 in 2019, leaving her husband to live alone in their Beverly Hills mansion. Adjusting to life without his lifelong partner has been difficult, and Pat admits he still misses Shirley dearly. He now shares his home with his dog and his housekeeper and claims to be doing well. Shirley not only impacted her husband, but also instilled important life lessons in their children. Recognizing their interest in the entertainment industry, she advised them to listen to their Grammy-winning father, who emphasized the importance of being authentic, making both the artist and the audience comfortable. Pat's daughter, Debbie, shared that her parents always insisted on treating everyone they met as if they were guests in their home and her father's actions back up his words. At 88 years old, Pat still looks sharp and active, as evidenced by a recent social media photo of him playing golf in a snazzy outfit consisting of a yellow cardigan, black checkered shorts, black socks, white sneakers, and a white cap. Fans were thrilled to see the pop singer still looking great. Despite the family's loss, Pat has remained close to his children. In celebration of his 88th birthday, his daughters Debbie and Linda took him out for dinner, with Pat happily posing with his arms around his daughters in another adorable photo posted on Instagram. What matters most? As Pat Boone has reflected on his 66-year marriage to his late wife Shirley, he remains amazed at how far they came. Despite facing challenges along the way, such as the toll that having four children took on Shirley's body, their commitment never wavered. Boone has always understood the importance of marriage and family and has made it a priority in life. He also values staying active, both physically and mentally, as evidenced by his love for golf and dedication to maintaining a sharp appearance. Besties with Elvis In the 1950s, Pat Boone and Elvis Presley were two of the most popular musicians in America. They both had a love for African-American music, but they approached it in different ways. While Elvis embraced the raw, uninhabited energy of rock and roll, Boone sang in a more polished, mainstream style that was very palatable to white audiences. Their paths crossed for the first time at a sock hop in Cleveland, Ohio, in October 1955. The event was hosted by DJ Bill Randall, who had invited the then-up-and-coming Elvis to perform. Pat was in attendance and was impressed by Elvis's raw talent, although he thought he could stand to take a few pointers. In fact, Boone later described Elvis as being spiritually starved and in need of guidance. Despite their different styles, Pat Boone and Elvis Presley both dominated the music charts in the 50s. From 1955 to 59, Boone had an incredible 41 hit records on the pop charts, 
just one more than Elvis's 40. But despite the intense competition, the two musicians held a deep admiration for each other's work and soon developed a lasting friendship. Elvis's influence on Pat's music was significant. Boone recorded several songs that originally had been performed by Elvis, including Don't Be Cruel and Love Me Tender. Boone was often criticized for whitewashing Elvis's music, but he maintained he was simply presenting it in a way that was more palatable to a mainstream audience. When Elvis passed away in 1977, Pat Boone was devastated. He considered Elvis a close friend, and he said he felt like he'd lost a brother. Boone went on to pay tribute to Elvis in various ways, including recording a tribute album and writing a book about their friendship. Despite different approaches to music and intense competition on the charts, Pat and Elvis shared a deep respect for each other. A Legacy That Will Never Die Pat Boone is an iconic figure in American music. With a career spanning over six decades, he was a chart-topping artist in the 50s and 60s, and his music remains popular. But Boone's legacy extends far beyond his music. He was also a successful actor, with numerous appearances in film and television. In fact, he was one of the biggest box office draws of the 50s, starring in movies like April Love and State Fair. Throughout his career, Boone remained true to his conservative Christian values, even in the face of criticism from those who found his views outdated. He was a vocal supporter of the conservative movement and was rumored to have turned down roles in films that conflicted with his beliefs. Today, Pat is in his 80s and is still active in the music industry. He continues to perform live shows and has released several albums in recent years. Boone's music may have been criticized for being too polished and safe, but his enduring popularity is a testament to the timeless quality of his melodies and the warmth of his voice. In the end, Pat's legacy will be remembered not just for his music, but for his unwavering commitment to his values and his role as a cultural icon of his era. He was a pioneer of the rock and roll movement, a Hollywood star, and a trailblazer for conservative values in the entertainment industry. Love him or hate him, Pat Boone is a figure that will be remembered for generations. Early Life Richard Wagstaff Clark, known professionally as Dick Clark, was born in Mount Vernon, New York on November 30, 1929. He grew up in the Bronx and attended Syracuse University, majoring in advertising and radio. After graduating, he landed his first job as a radio announcer in Utica, New York. This was at WRUN. He quickly became one of the most popular DJs in the area. He was known for his smooth voice and his ability to connect with his listeners. Clark's big break came in the early 50s when he began hosting a rock and roll radio show called The Dick Clark Show on WFIL in Philadelphia. It was a popular program that aired in the city during the 1950s and early 60s. The program was a major success and helped to launch his career. In 1956, he began hosting the TV show American Bandstand, which showcased popular artists and dance performers. American Bandstand was a music-based television program airing from 1952 to 1959. The show, which originated in Philly, was created by a figure named Bob Horn, but it was later taken over by Dick. Clark was able to secure the role of host after Bob was fired due to a drunk driving incident. Like Dick's radio program, the show featured live musical performances. This time, though, the whole thing was televised, and it allowed for some groundbreaking dance segments featuring teenagers dancing to the latest chart-topping hits. Over the next few years, with Dick Clark as the host, American Bandstand became a national phenomenon, attracting millions of viewers every day and introducing the world to some of the biggest names in rock and roll, including Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry, and Jerry Lee Lewis. Some of the many other musicians that Dick Clark helped to launch the careers of include Bobby Darin, Brenda Lee, Chubby Checker, and Neil Sedaka. Dick Clark's time on American Bandstand also resulted in him becoming known as America's oldest teenager for his youthful appearance and energetic hosting style. Despite being middle-aged, he remained very active and engaged in popular culture, which made him relatable to younger audiences. He was able to successfully connect with multiple generations of fans throughout his career due to the youthful attitude he maintained even into his twilight years. 
What did Dick do besides American Bandstand? Dick also hosted a variety of other notable TV shows over the years, including The $10,000 Pyramid, TV's Bloopers and Practical Jokes, and New Year's Rockin' Eve, which aired every New Year's Eve and became a beloved tradition for millions of viewers. He hosted $10,000 Pyramid from 1973 to 88. It involved two contestants who try to guess words or phrases based on clues given by their celebrity partners. As the rounds progressed, the players moved up a pyramid of increasing cash prizes, with the top being worth $10,000. Clark was a beloved host on the show and known for his smooth, charismatic style. He also occasionally filled in as a celebrity partner when one of the scheduled guests couldn't make it. Even before that, he began hosting New Year's Rockin' Eve specials in 1972 as a replacement for Guy Lombardo's New Year's special, which had been a long-running tradition. The show was an instant success and quickly became a beloved part of New Year's celebrations across the United States. Clark continued to host the show until his death in 2012, with Ryan Seacrest taking over as co-host in 2006. Clark was known to enjoy his role as the host of the New Year's Rockin' Eve specials, and he often expressed his excitement for the show leading up to the big night. One story from his time hosting involved a mishap during the 2000 broadcast when a technical glitch caused him to mistakenly announce that the new millennium had already begun. Despite the mistake, Clark was able to quickly recover and continue on with the show, demonstrating his professionalism and composure. Even after stepping down from his gig as host of American Bandstand in 1989, Dick Clark was always heavily involved in the music industry. In addition to his various hosting duties, he was also a producer for various record labels. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1993 in recognition of his contributions to the genre. He was also a philanthropist who supported numerous charities throughout his life. He was a strong advocate for diabetes research and was involved in several related organizations, including the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. Dick's Personal Life Dick was married three times and had three children. His first marriage was to Barbara Mallory, and they had two children together. After their divorce, he married Loretta Martin and had one child with her. Later in life, he married Carrie Wigton, who was his wife until his death. Despite his busy career and frequent travel, he maintained a strong relationship with his family and was dedicated to being a good husband and father. In his final years, Dick's third wife helped him out quite a bit. In 2004, Dick suffered a stroke that forced him to retire from hosting New Year's Rockin' Eve. At that point, he'd been a part of it for over 30 years. Despite this setback, he still continued to make occasional appearances on the show and remained involved in other aspects of the entertainment industry. Many admired his determination and resilience during this difficult time, and he continued to inspire with his strength and positive attitude. Fans were stunned by how he handled his stroke and subsequent recovery. He didn't let it stop him from continuing to pursue his passions and work in the industry he loved. He also used his platform and influence to raise awareness for stroke prevention and recovery, inspiring others who may have been going through similar experiences. His dedication to his family, philanthropic work, and maintaining strong relationships with those around him served as an example of how to live a fulfilling and meaningful life. Dick Clark's third wife, Carrie Wigton, was a constant source of support for him during his recovery from his stroke. She was with him 24-7 and even went as far as to quit her job to be there for him full-time. Her dedication and love for him were evident in everything she did, and she played a crucial role in helping him through one of the most challenging times in his life. It's clear their relationship was a strong and loving one, and they were a great team, both personally and professionally. Sadly, Clark passed away April 18, 2012 from a heart attack, just a few months after making his final appearance on a New Year's Rockin' Eve special. He was 82 years old at the time of his death. His death was widely mourned throughout the entertainment industry and among fans of his work. Funny Stories from His Career During a live broadcast in the 80s, Clark accidentally introduced Aretha Franklin as Areola Franklin, the Queen of Soul was understandably taken aback, but managed to keep her composure and deliver a stunning performance. Another naming mishap came years later. During a New Year's Rockin' Eve special in the 1990s, he mistakenly referred to the rapper LL Cool J as L Cool JJ. The mistake caused LL to burst out laughing and become even more popular with fans who appreciated his sense of humor.
Dick also had a propensity for dancing. In the early days of American Bandstand, Clark would often make up dance moves on the spot to fill airtime. One time, he invented a move called the swivel hips and got the studio audience to join in. Little did he know the move would become a sensation and be imitated by teenagers all across the country. He was also known for his love of puns and wordplay. On one episode of American Bandstand, he introduced a group called the Fendermen by saying, these guys really know how to pluck their strings and they're not bad on the guitar either. Jack Lord was strange in a good way. Jack Lord became a household name thanks to his time playing the lead on the TV series Hawaii Five-0. Despite his success in the entertainment industry, however, Lord's co-stars often made jokes about his peculiar behavior on set. One of his co-stars, Cam Fong, who played Detective Chin Ho Kelly, once revealed that Lord would stand in a corner and listen to classical music during breaks in filming. Fong said that Lord would also make the cast and crew wait for him while he finished his ritual of taking a shower before filming any scenes. Another co-star, James MacArthur, who played Detective Danny Williams, also commented on Lord's unusual behavior. MacArthur said Lord was very particular about his appearance and would often spend a lot of time in the makeup room making sure every hair on his head was in place. Despite the jokes and the teasing, Lord was known for his professionalism on set. He was always prepared for his scenes and would often spend long hours perfecting his character's lines and movements. Lord's career spanned several decades, and he appeared in numerous television shows throughout his life. His work in Hawaii Five-0 earned him a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1998 at age 77 due to congestive heart failure. But his legacy lives on through his memorable performances and the impact he made on the entertainment industry. While Lord was known for his success in the entertainment industry, he was also known for being very private, particularly in his relationship with his wife, Marie. Jack Lord loved his wife, Marie. Marie Lord was a talented actress and artist in her own right. Jack and Marie met in the early 60s in Hollywood, where they both worked in the entertainment industry. Marie worked as a model and actress, while Jack was already a successful actor who had appeared in several films. The details of how they met are not widely known, as the couple was quite private about their personal lives. Despite the 14-year age difference between them, Jack and Marie fell in love and got married in 1958. They remained together until his death in 1998, enjoying a long and loving marriage. Though Jack and his wife liked to keep their lives private, a rare interview Marie did with Hawaii Magazine in the 1980s gave readers a glimpse into her life with Jack. According to the interview, the couple spent most of their time at their home in Honolulu, where they enjoyed a quiet life together. Marie Lord described their home as a sanctuary, a place where they could retreat from the demands of their busy careers and enjoy each other's company. She talked about their love of art and how they had decorated their home with beautiful pieces they had collected over the years. In the interview, Marie also spoke about Jack's love of the sea and how he enjoyed sailing his boat, the Kona Kai, around the Hawaiian Islands. She talked about how the couple would often take off on spontaneous trips to explore the islands and how they enjoyed the freedom that came with living in Hawaii. Despite their private nature, the Lords were known for their philanthropy and generosity. They were active members of the community in Hawaii and were involved in numerous charitable organizations, including the Hawaiian Humane Society and the Hawaii Theater Center. Marie Lord passed away in 2005 at age 64 following a battle with cancer. Her passing was a great loss to the Hawaiian community and to those who knew her and Jack personally. The Lords are remembered fondly. In the years since their deaths, the Lords have continued to be remembered for their contributions to the entertainment industry and to their community in Hawaii. Murray was born in France in 1941 and grew up in Europe. She began her career as a model and actress, appearing in several European films before moving to the U.S. in the early 60s. She was known for her love of art and was an accomplished artist in her own right. She studied in Paris and had several exhibitions of her work in Hawaii. In addition to her artistic and philanthropic pursuits, she was also an avid gardener known for her beautiful gardens at their home in Hawaii. Her love and support for Jack throughout their long marriage was a testament to their enduring love. How Jack Got His Start Jack was born December 30, 1920 in Brooklyn. 
His parents were Irish immigrants, and he was raised in a working-class neighborhood. He attended St. Benedict Joseph Labra School and John Adams High School before enrolling in the U.S. Army during World War II. He served in the infantry and later in the U.S. Army Air Forces as a B-52 gunner. After the war, he studied at NYU on the GI Bill, where he took acting classes. He began his acting career on Broadway, appearing in productions like The Traveling Lady and Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. He also appeared in a number of TV shows, including the Philco Television Playhouse and Studio One. In 1958, he made his film debut in The Court Martial of Billy Mitchell, playing the role of a young officer. He went on to appear in a number of films, including God's Little Acre, The Hangman, and Dr. No. It was around this time that he was offered his iconic role on Hawaii Five-0. He was offered the role of Steve McGarrett by Leonard Freeman, the creator of the show. Freeman was impressed by Lord's commanding presence and deep voice, and he felt Lord was the perfect choice to play the tough, no-nonsense head of the Hawaiian State Police. Leonard was inspired by his love of Hawaii and his desire to create a series that would showcase the beauty and culture of the islands. It was filmed on location there, and the stunning landscapes and iconic landmarks like Diamond Head and Waikiki Beach became a major part of the show's identity. It was notable for its strong ensemble cast. It included actors like James MacArthur, Cam Fong, and Zulu. The chemistry between the characters was a big part of the show's appeal, and the camaraderie between McGarrett and his team was a key element in many of the show's storylines. The format typically involved a murder or other serious crime at the beginning of the episode, followed by an investigation led by McGarrett and his team. The investigations involved complex plots and a number of suspects, but McGarrett's sharp mind and unwavering dedication always led to the culprits being caught and brought to justice. It was also known for its iconic theme song composed by Morton Stevens. The driving, percussive theme became synonymous with the show and is still loved today. The show was a major success during its 12-year run, and was credited with helping popularize the police procedural genre. It was also notable for its groundbreaking casting of Asian actors in prominent roles like Cam Fong and Al Harrington. After the show ended, it remained popular in syndication and was later remade as a new series with the same name in 2010. Lord's portrayal of Steve McGarrett became iconic, and he was known for his catchphrase, Book'em Dano, which he used during arrests. He wasn't just the star of the show, he was also involved in production. He served as an executive producer for several seasons. George's Early Life George Harvey Strait Sr. was born May 18, 1952. He worked on his father's ranch on the weekends and summers. When he was in fourth grade, his mother left the family and took his sister Pensy with them. That left his father to raise him. George was always interested in music and started early. He performed in the rock and roll garage band The Stoics in high school. Their music was inspired by the Beatles, who also inspired his later works. He listened to other singers like Hank Thompson and George Jones. He was also influenced by Frank Sinatra, whom he's often compared to. Despite this, he didn't listen to country music much as a child. He focused on the news and farmers' reports. His love of country was cemented by live performances prevalent in every nearby town. Watching them made him realize he wanted to do the same thing. Who is Norma? Norma Voss was born May 18, 1952, and raised in Pearsall, Texas. There isn't too much information available about her, but she didn't have experience with living in the spotlight until becoming the power behind the throne of the king of country. She's supported him in everything he's done and even made a few brief appearances in his works. See if you can spot her in the music video for Codigo. A Cowboy Love Story George and Norma were high school sweethearts, and he called her, quote, the first girl I ever loved. They grew up in a small town where everyone knew everyone. He never thought anything about her at first, seeing her as just another girl in his class. His opinion eventually changed as he started to see how beautiful she was. He asked her out one day and they went on a date. It took a long time after that for him to realize he was missing the best thing in his life. So he asked her out again. And she hadn't forgotten him either. Art mirrored life when, just as in his song Check Yes or No, young lovers went on to be a married couple. They eloped in Mexico December 4, 1971, when she was 19. They had a small church wedding for friends and family to satisfy their parents later in Texas. They didn't have much time to rest or enjoy a honeymoon, though. George enlisted in the Army and went to the Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. 
His wife came along, and they had their daughter, Jennifer, October 6, 1972. Working while in love George performed in an Army-sponsored country group called Rambling Country. He was honorably discharged in 1975 and began to seek higher education. He enrolled at Texas State University and graduated with a degree in agriculture. Years later, after becoming a major star, he received an honorary doctorate from the school and established an endowment fund there. His career didn't take off immediately, though. His early experience was enough to get his feet wet, but not enough to make him a star. An opportunity came along when he found a flyer advertising a request for a new lead vocalist for a band called Stony Ridge. He auditioned and got the gig. He was touring Texas, but no major labels wanted him. He had to work on cattle ranches and design cattle pens just to support his family. That persistence turned 1981 into perhaps the most important year of his life. He released his first single, Unwound. He got a contract with MCA Records, and he and Norma also welcomed their second child, George Bubba Strait Jr. George's career started to explode after that. He had his first number one single, Foolhearted Memory, in 1982. Then he had a string of hits, such as A Fire I Can't Put Out, You Look So Good in Love, Right or Wrong, and Let's Fall to Pieces Together. The 80s were a massive decade for him, with seven albums reaching number one on the country charts. The 90s saw his film debut in 1992's Pure Country, and the following decades helped him become one of the best-selling artists of all time. Norma appeared in his works from time to time, like in music videos, but she remained a homemaker until Bubba went off to college. She then joined her husband on his Cowboy Rides Away tour in 2014. It drew in 105,000 people and broke a record for the largest indoor concert in North America. They became grandparents February 2, 2012, when Bubba and his wife welcomed George Strait III. They call him by his middle name, Harvey. Another grandchild came on September 10, 2016, a girl named Jillian Louise. They live close enough for the family to get together often. A Tragic Loss Jennifer Strait died at age 13 in a car accident, June 25, 1986. She was a passenger in a car that went too fast around a turn. She wasn't wearing her seatbelt and was the only fatality of the four people in the car. The driver was not under the influence of alcohol, and criminally negligent homicide charges against him were dropped. George hasn't said much about how the tragedy affected him or his family. He became much more reserved and stayed out of the public eye for a while after it happened. He didn't want to spread his grief to anyone else. Instead, he threw himself into his work and released 11 straight number one singles. There's speculation that he dedicated a song to her, though it's never been proven. It was called Baby Blue and released in 1988. The lyrics talk about longing for a woman who brought light into his life but is now gone. And George seems to be in pain when he sings it live. He did give one interview to People magazine in 2012 about the loss of his daughter. He said he and his family were blessed to have been able to spend the 13 years they did get with her. The Straits also founded the Jennifer Strait Memorial Foundation in 1986 in her honor. The nonprofit gets private donations and distributes them to charities that serve children in the San Antonio area. Looking back on life and true love. George is a private man. Being one of the most successful country western singers of all time comes with a constant need to hide from paparazzi and reporters. He often doesn't get recognized if he's not wearing a cowboy hat and lies if fans say they saw him around. That doesn't mean he's not willing to open up about the most important things in life. One of them is his relationship with Norma. He said they were blessed to have found each other. They've always done everything together and have been able to love and like each other through decades of marriage. He's posted on Instagram more than once in honor of their anniversary, but he took it up a notch once they'd gone through a few decades together. They celebrated their 50th anniversary in December of 2021. He sang his hit song, I Cross My Heart, to her in Vegas. It was a way to publicly express his gratitude for standing by him. George is also grateful for their children. He has honored his daughter and loves working together with his son. Bubba is a rodeo cowboy and songwriter. They've collaborated on songs such as Here for a Good Time. He loves seeing his son's passion for writing and playing the guitar, and it helped him get back into songwriting as well. In addition to regular Las Vegas residencies and one-off stadium shows, he's got a nine-date stadium tour with Chris Stapleton planned for 2024. Burt Reynolds thought Sally Field's talent made her sexy. 
Much has been made of the several years the two were romantically involved. Their romance began during the filming of Smokey and the Bandit, though apparently they knew each other from before. In fact, it was Bert who helped Sally get her part in the film. The studio apparently alleged that Sally wasn't sexy enough for the part, and Bert fired back that Sally had acting talent, and that talent made her sexy. Bert's insistence that the studio hire Sally to play her role in Smokey and the Bandit paid off, as the film was a success and made both Bert and Sally bigger stars than ever. Bert certainly put his money where his mouth was when it came to pitching Sally to the studio, but Bert did, in fact, find Sally's talent to be sexy, and he wasn't able to keep his hands off her while filming. Bert was known for wooing co-stars. Burt Reynolds had hooked up with his co-stars on his films plenty of times before, but he claims to have known right from the beginning of their relationship that there was something different about Sally. While Burt had dated other stars for periods of years and had even been married to actress Judy Carn for several years in the 60s, there was something about the several-year-long romance with Sally Field that came to define the actor's personal life. He had plenty of romances, but he went to his deathbed claiming Sally Field had been the love of his life. In the years leading up to the actor's death, he'd made comments insinuating that he deeply regretted how short their time together had been. However, comments made by Sally Field in the wake of Burt's death suggest that maybe the actor was being a bit delusional when it came to how much importance he was placing on the short-lived relationship. Sally claims Burt was no good for her. According to Sally Field, Burt Reynolds was simply no good for her and their relationship fell apart naturally. She has no regrets about how it ended and she feels Burt placed a false importance on her later in his life simply because she'd been the one who got away. It seems that Sally feels Burt went to his deathbed valuing her more than any of his other former lovers because she'd been the one who had been the least attainable. This revelation from Sally was published in her memoir released after Burt Reynolds' death. According to Sally, she hadn't initially intended to publish it which resulted in her perhaps being a bit more open about things that happened in the past than she should have been. But with Bert gone, she felt free to let the dark details of their relationship spill out into the public. Sally claims she was initially flattered by Bert's insistence that she somehow had been the love of his life, but that it got creepy by the time he passed away. The History of Sally and Bert's Romance Sally and Bert had only known each other for a short period before production on Smokey and the Bandit, but their relationship quickly progressed during the movie's production. According to Sally, the intensive nature of the film shoot made them bond quicker than they would have otherwise, and they left the filming feeling as if they had a future. Both stars felt their relationship was more than a simple love affair, and they quickly made their romance public. For the next several years, the celebrity couple of Sally Field and Burt Reynolds was a big thing. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to Facts First if you haven't already, and stick around for more about Sally and Bert. Sally and Bert continued to work together. Following Sally and Bert's successful work together in Smokey and the Bandit in 1977, they continued appearing together in films. Meanwhile, their relationship was blossoming into something more and more serious. They could be seen together in the films Hooper and The End, both of which were released in 1978. In 1980, they reunited on screen for the sequel Smokey and the Bandit 2. There was an imbalance of power. Sally wasn't all that far into her career at the time she met Burt, and the much bigger actor proved a pretty big influence over the younger actress. Quickly into their relationship, there proved to be an imbalance of power, as Sally found herself often changing who she was to please her elder companion. In the beginning, she embraced the influence Burt had over her lifestyle. But by the end of the relationship, Sally claimed she began to feel she was lacking her own identity. Sally claims she ceded to Bert's controlling nature at first because the older actor made her feel special. But as she began to bend herself to fit his needs, she realized it wasn't truly her the star was attracted to. As Bert began pushing for Sally to marry him, the actress found herself denying the request. This only made Bert more adamant, and these feelings apparently only grew inside Bert following the disillusion of their relationship. Sally refused to marry Bert, so he broke things off. Burt Reynolds apparently asked Sally Field to marry him many times, and she repeatedly said no. Burt ended up cheating on Sally and breaking off the relationship as a result. Previously, he had broken off his several-year-long relationship with talk show host Dinah Shore after she had denied his continued requests for marriage. It was later revealed Dinah had said no because of a cancer diagnosis she had kept a secret, while Sally denied Burt's request because she was simply unsure if he was really the one. Burt Reynolds had many romantic regrets. Burt went to his deathbed claiming Sally had been the perfect companion and that it had simply been in his nature as a man to screw the relationship up. 
He passed away in 2018 at age 82. At that point, he and Sally had long since ceased any and all communication. According to Bert, this was because they simply lived too far apart. But Sally would likely have a much different interpretation. Bert may have placed a ridiculous amount of importance on women like Sally Field and Dinah Shore as a result of them being the ones who managed to get away. But the actor certainly had no trouble finding romantic partners over the years. But he always made it clear to his prospective partners that getting married and having kids was his endgame. Sadly, he never achieved it properly. Burt Reynolds' second and last wife Burt's second wife was Lonnie Anderson, whom he married in 1988 and divorced in 94. They had met while filming Stroker Ace. Of course, Lonnie was a TV star known for her tenure on WKRP in Cincinnati. Over the course of their marriage, they adopted a son. Finally, Burt was granted his wish of having a child. That child is Quinton Anderson Reynolds. Oddly, Sally Field went on to marry also at the end of her and Bert's relationship, and she divorced from her spouse the same year Bert divorced from Lonnie. Sally had been married once previously, from 1968 to 75. That was to a man named Alan Stephen Craig, while her second marriage was to a man named Alan Graceman. Sally is now 75 years old and still working, with one of her recent notable acting credits being in 2012's Lincoln. Now it's time to hear from you. What was the most surprising part of this story to you? Let us know in the comments section below. And before you go, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to Factsverse if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all our latest content.